Welcome to the Curious Advantage podcast, an exploration of the idea of curiosity and its increasing importance for thriving in the digital age from the authors of The Curious Advantage. Welcome to this episode of The Curious Advantage podcast. This series is about how individuals and organizations use the power of curiosity to drive success in their lives and businesses, especially in the context of our new digital reality. It brings to life the latest understanding from neuroscience, anthropology, history, business, and behaviorism about curiosity and makes these useful for everyone. My name is Simon Brown. I'm one of the co-authors of the book, The Curious Advantage, and the Chief Learning Officer at Novartis. And today I'm here with my co-authors, Paul Ashcroft. Hi. And Garrick Jones. Hi, Simon. We're delighted to be joined by Lisa Bodell, award-winning author and CEO of FutureThink. Welcome to The Curious Advantage podcast, Lisa. Hey, thanks for having me. It is a pleasure to be here. I was looking again at your bio ahead of today's conversation. Uh, I must admit, it is super impressive. Uh, You're founder and CEO of FutureThink, a company that uses simple techniques to help organizations embrace change and increase their capability for innovation. Uh, You've transformed teams within Novartis, uh, but also in organizations like Google, Accenture, HBO, and more. You've been listed as one of the top 100 keynote speakers in the world, and you share your message to over 100,000 people a year. Uh, Not only that, you've launched three successful businesses, written two books, uh, Kill the Company and Why Simple Wins, travelled to over 40 countries and sit on boards such as Novartis Diversity and Inclusion Board and the Global Advisory Council for none other than the World Economic Forum. Wow. (laughs) I'm in awe. Where do we start today? When I first met you a couple of years ago and you were encouraging us to kill the company based upon the ideas in your best-selling book. Killing the company seems like something maybe that we wouldn't want to do. So maybe let's start (laughs) with uh, why might killing the company be a good idea? Yeah, let's just say it's it's interesting. I went for that title on the book so I could be really provocative, but sometimes it makes people pause because no one wants to kill (laughs) their company, right? Exactly. I, I do know, though, and I love that you asked this, Simon, is that the people that ask me about it are the ones that are, are willing to take bold moves. Mm-hmm. And um, the idea of killing the company is really proactive obsolescence. So what it is, is how can you look at the weaknesses in your company and figure out how to turn them into strengths before somebody does it to you? So the idea is about being ahead of the game versus being caught off guard by your competitors. And we're already seeing the people that are really good at killing their company with COVID because you don't want to be that company, right? That has to wait for a burning platform Mm -hmm. to change. You want it to constantly be something that you're doing and improving. And the people that have really pivoted well during COVID are those kind of people that are not afraid to quote, kill their company and create something totally new in times of extreme change. And I know you're seeing that too at Novartis, as well as you know, the other people here listening today, being agile, and not being afraid to look at your weaknesses is a plus, not a weakness. Diving a little deeper into that. So wh- where does one start in thinking about how one might kill the company? Well, you know, it, it's not hard. It, it's a really cool exercise. And we recommend to people, first and foremost, is do it before strategic planning. Mm-hmm. And because too much of strategic planning, right, Simon, is um, they look at what they already have from last year. And then how much more can we do in the future? And the idea with kill the company is, pretend that you're your number one competitor and wear that hat of your number one competitor and put yourself out of business. So attack everything inside the company or your team or your function, whatever you're dealing with and figure out where you're weak, what overlaps you have, what redundancies, what's not profitable, where your pricing's not good, where your org chart is weak and highlight those things and try and put yourself quote out of business or attack those weaknesses. How would you do it? And that really lets you set up a prioritization of what do we need to improve and how can we turn those back onto our competition? Um, It's great before strategic planning to really figure out what you want to shore up and what you want to put budget against for the next year. We started that a couple of years ago and it it certainly seemed to uh, not yet uh, enable us to be killed off. So that's good news. (laughs) Good. Then you did it right. So that's great. (laughs) 
uh, with your help. So let's um, let's move on. So I know a big part of um, what you talk about is, is a focus on questions, um, but not just any type of questions, um, a particular type of questions of killer questions. We strongly agree on the importance of great questions as well. Uh, and in our conclusion in The Curious Advantage, we actually conclude the book with uh, to question is the answer. But can you tell us a bit more on what killer questions are and why killer questions are so important? It's less about killer questions. It's more about, you know, creative problem solving isn't about getting great ideas. It's about solving the right problems. And asking questions help us determine what is the right problem to solve. And I think right now the issue that so many companies and people have is that they're so focused on getting the answer, they've forgotten how to ask a good question. And we need to do that because, you know, my belief is that in the future, asking the right questions is going to be more important than finding the right answer. So, you know, for example, there's that saying is that, um, you know, machines are for answers and people are for questions. So, you know, Google isn't a search engine, it's an answer engine. It can give me any answer I want. It just depends on the question I'm asking. So to get people to ask really killer questions are the kinds that wake up our mind. They're open-ended. They literally hijack our brain and make us want to just focus on that topic at hand. Um, there's actually a term for it, right? It's called instinctive elaboration. And the more we think about something, the more likely we are to come up with better and more creative solutions for it. Really good questions are very important because it really focuses on what's the right problem to solve. I really like what you were saying there also about Google being a, not just a search engine, but a question answer. And people that talk to me and say, oh, you seem to be good at working Google just to find things. I think you made me reflect that she's not I'm good at finding things. I'm persistent about keep asking questions. Could you give us some examples of some killer questions and how can we learn to craft better killer questions ourselves? Isn't there something awe-inspiring about people who are so good at like finding the right search terms? I actually think that's a really good thing to teach people is like, what are the different creative ways to search in Google because that's a great way to teach people how to ask better questions too. Right. Yeah. So let's give you an example of a usual suspect question versus a killer question. You know those meetings you go into and everyone always asks like, you know, the boring question, who's got an idea or does anyone have a solution? Those are the worst questions. They're boring. You're going to get the same old answers. For example, rather than saying, how could we improve our products or services? Why not instead say, Hey guys, if we were going to win an outstanding product or service award, what would it celebrate and why? Or one of my favorites that one of my clients at a bank came up with was, rather than saying, how can we improve our culture? Instead, he asked, you've just written a tell-all book about the organization. What secrets are you about to reveal? And those kind of questions, right, they just kind of ignite your thinking in a whole new way. They're not boring, they're provocative, and they really get you thinking. What's going on in your mind while you're crafting those questions? Because it seems that you're running through some kind of process or some kind of framework that's switching from a question that's not really going to get us anywhere to something that really might become a killer question. At the heart of it, if you want a framework, there's four parts to a killer question. So first and foremost, it's got to be open-ended. If you can answer it with a yes or a no, it's not a good question. So it's open-ended, it's simple. So no multi-part questions. I think it has to be provocative, really wake up my mind. And I also think it's, it's interesting to consider the positive and negative angles of a question. Let me give you an example that Starbucks had. They wanted to figure out how um, could they have pets be allowed in their stores, this is in the United States, without alienating people, because it's not as common to have pets in stores. And what they did is they, they asked people who might be offended having or not want pets in stores, what would they need to do to make sure that the people that didn't like pets would still want to come into their stores? So asking about the negative angle is also important as well. I look at those four things, open-ended, simple, provocative, positive, and negative, to know if I've really got a great question. Mm. One of the things we talk about, the three of us, Simon, Paul, and myself, often is what would be the new MBA that we would teach the next generation who mm. living in this kind of new digital reality where you know the pyramid has shifted. It's no longer command and control and top down. It really is, everybody is connected. And the thing I really would love to add to that, that curriculum for the new MBA would be your thing of how to ask great questions, how to interrogate Google so that you get great responses or great replies. I think it's a huge, hugely important skill for the next gen generation. 
you know, and well, if you end up doing it, call me, okay? Because I'm in, and I. <laughs> <laughs> the reason, the reason why is because, and um, you know, all of us here have talked about this, which is, I think the most important thing is we spent so much time, right? I, I talk a lot about T-shaped people and teams versus I-shaped people and mm -hmm. teams, and we, right? We've all spent so much time in our schooling and then at companies building subject matter expertise. But the problem is for the future, it's. Yes, you need that, but the people and the companies that succeed are the ones that build these, the T-shaped skills, right? The broader yes. general or what we call power skills. Curiosity yes. is one of those skills, right? It doesn't matter how smart you are as a scientist if you're not curious or if you can't collaborate or if you can't ask good questions. So yeah. I think it is critical to your point to teach that in, in an MBA course, whether they call it inquiry or questioning, because they can sure. take it so many different places. You're listening to The Curious Advantage podcast, inspired by the book The Curious Advantage, written by Paul Ashcroft, Simon Brown, and Garrick Jones. Subscribe to the podcast today. And for us, one of the great critical elements of that MBA is also part of curiosity, which we call criticality and the ability to be aware of your unconscious bias. And the reason is, I mean, if you're not biased, if you're just Googling and searching things that give you pleasure, or you're just searching things that reinforce your own belief systems, you're not keeping it open and you're not learning. You're not going to new places that are sometimes a little bit difficult to deal with or make you uneasy. And so for us, criticality is really an important part of curiosity and being aware of our unconscious bias as well as being able to push our boundaries and to experiment with creativity and construction. But criticality, we think, is at the heart. What role do you think bias plays in how we craft our questions? There's one part of the book in The Curious Advantage that I would direct people to. There's a lot in here, by the way, that I loved. But it would be the section, the chapter on criticality. That was far and away my favorite. And the reason I liked it, a couple things, and then I want to talk about bias is, one, it addresses bias. Two, it talks about this issue where I think people, they don't understand what questioning and being curious is, and they confuse it with being critical or causing conflict. And yeah. what we want to do is tell people it's not about conflict, it's about contrast. Because what we're trying to do is question our assumptions and challenge our biases and learn something new. So criticality is more about critical thinking, not being critical. That's a language shift. But the reason I think it's great about understanding our biases is people don't realize that, you know, asking questions and being curious is kind of, it's a diversity issue. We have to make sure that to be curious, right, you have to ask a lot of different people and audiences things to challenge yes. assumptions. And yes. you have to create a culture, right, where people feel comfortable and equal and able to ask the questions. One thing I want to build on is this whole idea around it being a diversity issue, and it's a cultural issue too. And I think you just said a couple of things that were interesting. The first is creating a culture where everyone feels that they are allowed to ask questions and that they are their questions are heard. That's a big deal because I, you know, we all come from companies where we have smart people. We can teach them how to craft a killer question, but do they feel comfortable asking it? Whether it's cultural, they're introvert versus extrovert, those are things that leaders have to remember. And the other thing is, who are you asking the questions of? For example, one of the things we talk about is you need to ask unusual suspects your questions. So W Hotels, they always ask questions in their brainstorms of people that have fired them. People that have said, I never want to stay at your hotels again because they realize that asking those people questions is gonna be more productive than their fans. So it's also the audience, so we can really challenge our assumptions and be more diverse. I love that. And I guess that there's a really important role there that leaders need to play in creating that safe environment and encouraging the curiosity for people to be able to ask those questions, answer those questions and feel safe in where things go. What role do you see that leaders have in creating that space? Leaders set the tone. If leaders don't ask the questions, no one else asks the questions. So they have to really mirror the environment and ask a lot of questions and be curious about it. I think there's a few things that leaders can specifically do to start creating this culture. First of all, have meetings or settings that are both shaped by large groups, but also small groups, because that can help you with those introverts and extrovert issues. Uh -huh. I think leaders should also proactively call on people. So too often as leaders, we think we need to be open and ask for everyone's feedback. 
But the problem is usually it's just the extroverts or the bold people that speak out or speak over everyone. So by calling on specific people, everyone feels heard and you get more diversity. Another thing is when you ask questions or you have answers for them, use a variety of response methods. So the reason why in our digital, you know, our, our COVID world right now is having chat is really important versus voice answers because people that are a little bit shyer or want to be, remain anonymous, um, having the chat can be better than just verbal. Thinking through, can everybody feel like their voice is heard and can ask a question really needs a lot of preparation. It's amazing how the back channels have enriched our conversations. We may not be able to be in the same room with everybody, but we certainly having two or three conversations going on simultaneously. And I wonder how much of the real work gets done in the back channels. <laughs> well, you know, what you just said is important, right? It's also that informality that really can generate some good things too. So I, I think that's a valid point. Let's talk about curiosity. From your broad perspective, what do you see the role of curiosity playing in companies going forward? I really think that curiosity is just this unsung hero. There's so many benefits. And first of all, it's going to help people in terms of challenging their biases and improving their decision making. If you position it as something that it makes your decision more bulletproof, that's kind of cool. It sparks other people to be more creative in their problem solving. Curiosity is seen to also uncover disruptive opportunities. The people that win aren't the companies that do, do things like everyone else. The people that win are the companies that do things like no one else. And that only happens with curiosity. It's, the other side of that is it also mitigates your risk. It enhances your leadership because it shows that you are open to other people's opinions and ideas. To me, it's a critical leadership skill as well. Have you got some stories, Lisa, from the work that you've done with sort of leading companies uh, like Google and, of course, Novartis and I'm sure many others, where those organizations are really working with curiosity as a value or as a way of being within the organization? How are they getting that right? And what have you seen as where they're getting some success out of that? One is they're modeling the behavior. It's set out, much like I've seen with Novartis, as a strategic skill. It's a tenant of the organization, curiosity. And so that shows that it is aligned from the top and that we expect it of everybody. But until the leaders do it, it doesn't matter. Organizations that are great at it, the leaders are constantly questioning in a productive, positive way, not a blaming way. The second thing, frankly, is that they measure it in terms of performance reviews. So one of the things that I always ask people is, I don't really know if you have a culture of curiosity until you can show me how you can measure it. It can be the number of questions that are asked. It's how you embed questions into your process. It's ideas that you came up with based on asking better questions. That's another thing to think about is how do we want to measure curiosity so people know that it's something that they must do as part of their improvement. Yeah, I think that's so right. How do you measure curiosity and what's then the impact across the organization of that? It's tangible. I think to your point, what you get at us really well is that impact. So it's the first step, right, is getting people just to do it. And then it's what's the impact of it, which should be solving better problems, being more disruptive, coming up with bigger ideas. A curious culture is a game changer. What does curiosity mean for you? Follow hashtag Curious Advantage and join the conversation. Part of our research at the moment is to go further with curiosity and specifically to come up with both the qualitative and quantitative analyses for Good. what do you measure to measure curiosity? I remember, you know, 20 years ago, the question was about innovation. How do we measure innovation? And we've pretty much cracked that. But I think the same is true now for curiosity. We want to know how to measure curiosity and multivariant way of measuring curiosity, not only to question people at a qualitative level, but also to go deep on the data that's connected anyway through the interrogation of systems and uh, HR data and so on, and see if we can define those specific variables. That's for us, it's early days, but that's for us the next step in our, in our curiosity journey. You talked about curiosity being an important way of de-risking. Talk a little bit more about that. You know, we started this by talking about challenging biases and assumptions. And to me, that's how you mitigate your risk. Too often when we just follow the same path that we've always done, we don't see the risks coming. And so by constantly challenging things, because, you know, the world's not static, we've seen that, we constantly are making sure that we're looking out for all risks, large and small. So we have to constantly challenge our assumptions. What might have been good last year might have outlived its time. And having a culture that allows us to do that makes sure that you're always getting rid of that risk. 
I think the key it, though is that how you ask the question, and this gets also to your measurement point, which is it's not about the number of questions, it's about the quality of the question. You can go from having somebody that gets results by just saying what's good about our products and services versus how can we win an award for our products and services. You mm. can see the difference in the quality of ideas that come from the killer questions versus the bad questions. The quality part that you're getting at is going to be the key nut to crack. And that also links to how good are you as a Googler? The quality of your questioning leads to the quality of your outcomes. Everyone could argue that with the advent of such what's about to explode with AI, you're going to be able to get yeah. a lot of different ways that technology can connect new dots. But which yeah. dots do you want to connect? So that, that's where humans can really come into play. I think, Lisa, one thing I'd like to add on that is the idea that you are just going through my mind as you're talking about who you ask in the organization and trying to ask somebody different that you normally wouldn't if you could follow through and see where has that question gone out into the organization sort of map that out as if you were mapping the organization as a network you can map the flow of the question and where that go and where that lands oh i love it especially with the you know the advent of the graph right everyone wants to be part of whatever the knowledge graph is and you're 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 doing question mapping like mind mapping brilliant I love it. You know, I've got two kids and you're always wondering you know, what subjects or what skills to build for them. Building the ability to ask great questions is something that is going to be increasingly in demand and uh, valuable in the future and uh, a great thing for them to focus a bit of time on getting that right now. You really hit the nail on the head with that. I was with the World Economic Forum, gosh, a few years ago now, and they were talking about right the behavioral skills for the future. And one of the most important skills for the future for children was inquiry because of the advent of technology. It's not about the answers, it's about the ability to ask questions versus just follow rules, right? We're coming out of that industrial age and more of that creative age. So I think that is a key thing that we need to do with kids at a young age. Interesting. I have a killer question for you, Lisa. Please. <laughs> <laughs> what is your definition of curiosity? My definition of curiosity, I guess at its base, it's really, it's the desire to learn. So if I'm being curious, I'm trying to learn something. And that's either I'm seeking to understanding how something works, or I'm questioning my assumptions around how something's done, or I'm seeking to understand a different perspective that's not like mine. So whatever it is at its core, it's just a general desire to learn. What makes you most curious? And indeed, what's making you most curious at the moment? There's a lot of ways I get curious. And I, I've got a good story too about kids and curiosity, but um, you know, as a futurist, I should be curious by nature, and that's my background as a futurist. So I'm constantly looking at like why, how, what if, why not. But when something's completely new to me, that's when I get really turned on and curious. Like, what did they say yesterday about finding life on Venus? I mean, I just, wow, or how someone's cleaning up the ocean. I'm really curious about how someone came up with something that big and new and disruptive. You know, the other times when I'm curious is when I'm frustrated. Because if someone is making me frustrated, they're challenging my assumptions around how I see things. And rather than be frustrated by that, I think it's good to be curious about it so we can either reinforce our beliefs or challenge our way of thinking. Uh, I know that you've oh, no. <laughs> had a chance to read The Curious Advantage. So uh, what's the aspect in there that makes it you know, a bestseller in your eyes and your, your thoughts on that you take away from it? What I really liked about it was the different angles that you took on curiosity. And I will tell you, two things really stuck up to me. First of all, I love the fact that right up front, you talked about the importance of the behavioral skills, because I really think curiosity is important. And too often before, people put it under that terrible phrase of soft skills. And we have to stop calling it soft skills, and we have to reframe them as power skills. Mm, yeah. Because it is a power skill that sets people apart. It makes the, the person with depth have um, the ability to go across the organization and beyond it. So that was really important right up front. And the second thing is, I really wanna go back to that criticality piece because questions, yes, can make you more creative, but the idea is not to just come up with something new and different. Mm -hmm. it's, it's supposed to come up with something completely unique. And that's yeah. to me a little different, right? If, if I'm an organizational leader, my job is not to be the best at what I do, my job is to be the only one that does what I do. And by being curious, that's how I can get there. If I'm not curious, I'll just be the best of what everyone else already does. And that's not enough anymore. But that's what curiosity, ultimately, that's the big goal. 
We have a closing question that we, we ask everyone, but again, I'm trying to, trying to put it into a, a killer question mode. So, yeah. uh, to, so t- to make this our, our best podcast episode to date, what's the one thing our listeners should take away? You know, I like to talk about the power of curiosity, and I talk about an experience I had with my son. Years ago, I took him on a trip for the first time outside of the United States. He was young, and I think it is incredibly important for people to travel if they can, particularly for Americans, to get out and see the world. And my son, I had an opportunity to go to Spain, to Madrid and Barcelona. And he knew very little conversational Spanish and he was very intimidated that he wanted to go. And we went and I was there for some work and he's, you know, he sat through some of my keynotes and sessions, but we were invited to a dinner that night. And there were a group of scientists there from, oh my gosh, 19 other countries. And it was a dinner and blah, blah, blah. And he was very struck and he said to me afterwards, he, was, he had a nice time, but he said to me, mom, you know, that was really weird. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, because of all the things I've seen now, like, I, you know, he sees how people either drove differently or they, there's a cultural custom that was different or how uh-huh. they ate something different. And he just said, it was really weird. And I said, why do you think it was weird? And he said, because that's not how we do it. And I said, but you realize when people look at you, they think you're weird. And he paused and he said, no. <laughs> he was like, no, that's not true, right? I'm sorry, he's seven. That, no, mom, that can't be true. And I said, listen, if you're going to travel with mom, you can't use the word weird. You have to use the word different. Mm. And the reason that's important for people, especially as adults, is people that don't know how to critically think or be curious think everything is weird because that sets up right or wrong. They don't question assumptions. People that think in terms of different look at the world in terms of challenging assumptions and possibilities. And that's what I think makes a really curious person. You, it's not weird, it's different. Thank you so much for joining us, Lisa. Thank you for having me, it was a pleasure. Yeah, I learned so much. The four elements of the framework that enable you to ask killer questions, something that really stays with me. And I'm going to uh, not be so hard on my kids for uh, searching on Google. <laughs> <laughs> core learning skill by Te- the teach them better search skills if you've enjoyed uh, listening to lisa then check out her book so kill the company and uh, why simple wins as well so thank you for joining us lisa uh, you've been listening to a curious advantage podcast the curious advantage book is available on amazon worldwide order your copy now to further explore the seven c's model for being more curious and join the conversation at hashtag curious advantage subscribe today and keep exploring curiously see you next time This podcast is produced by Aliki Palinelli and John McGinty and edited by Jill Damatak-Futter.